Tympanocentesis is defined as needle aspiration of fluid from the middle ear. In children with acute otitis media, drainage of pus from the middle ear results in a rapid and marked improvement in symptoms and enables the clinician to prescribe tailored antimicrobial therapy. This video will demonstrate the technique of tympanocentesis. Tympanocentesis is recommended in children with refractory acute otitis media, in immunocompromised children with otitis media, and in children with suppurative complications of acute otitis media, such as mastoiditis or facial paralysis. Tympanocentesis is contraindicated in children with tympanostomy tubes and in children with congenital stenosis of the ear canal. Parents need to understand the purpose of the procedure, its risks, and its benefits. The procedure should be explained and informed consent documented in the medical record. In preparation for tympanocentesis, provide appropriate analgesia 30 minutes before the procedure. Acetaminophen with codeine may be used as oral analgesia. Alternatively, a cotton ball soaked with tetracaine may be inserted into the external auditory canal 30 minutes before the procedure. The following equipment is necessary. A papoose board, a surgical otoscope with speculum, a suction device, a tympanocentesis aspirator with a 3-inch 18-gauge needle, a second aspirator with flexible tubing, and cotton balls. Attach the needle to the tympanocentesis aspirator, then attach the aspirator to the suction device. If a tympanocentesis aspirator is not available, it is possible to use a 3 milliliter syringe connected to a 3 inch 18 gauge spinal tap needle that is bent at its midpoint to a 30 degree angle. Given the manipulation required to bend the needle and the relatively weaker suction achieved when using a syringe, this is not the preferred method. First, fully immobilize the child in a papoose board and secure the child's head. Cerumen should be removed before you begin the procedure. We will demonstrate the procedure itself with this animation, which shows the steps from the coronal view. Under direct visualization, advance the needle toward the tympanic membrane while keeping your thumb poised over the orifice of the tympanocentesis aspirator without occluding it. Insert the needle tip through the inferior portion of the tympanic membrane, 2 to 3 millimeters above its inferior rim. Immediately after penetrating the tympanic membrane, place your thumb on the orifice of the tympanocentesis aspirator and start suctioning the middle ear fluid. Once pus is visualized in the aspirator, promptly remove your thumb from the aspirator to avoid losing the specimen into the suction tubing. Use a second tympanocentesis aspirator with a flexible catheter to suction any remaining pus from the middle ear. Insert the catheter through the speculum and place it over the opening in the tympanic membrane made by the needle. The catheter should not go through the tympanic membrane. This step also clears the debris in the external auditory canal and may enhance visualization of the tympanic membrane at future visits. The steps of the procedure are as follows. Insert the otoscope into the external auditory canal using your dominant hand and visualize the umbo and the annulus. Once the instrument is in the proper position, use your non-dominant hand to hold the otoscope in place. Insert the needle attached to the tympanocentesis aspirator, which is in turn attached to the suction device. Penetrate the inferior part of the tympanic membrane with the needle. Use a second aspirator with flexible tubing to suction any remaining blood and pus from the canal. Place a small cotton pledget in the external auditory canal to absorb any remaining blood or pus and release the child from the restraint. Remove the plastic receptacle from the tympanocentesis aspirator, cap it, and send the specimen for microbiologic evaluation. 
The incidence of complications of tympanocentesis has not been studied systematically, but appears to be extremely low. Complications may include disruption of the ossicles, the incus, stapes, and malleus, piercing of the oval or round windows, laceration of the facial nerve or the corda tympani, bleeding from a high-riding bulb of the internal jugular vein, and chronic perforation of the tympanic membrane. The likelihood of incurring complications can be minimized by ensuring adequate immobilization, bracing the hands against the child's head, and paying careful attention to the point of needle insertion. Damage to the oval window, ossicles, or facial nerve can be prevented by ensuring that the needle is inserted in the inferior portion of the tympanic membrane. Bleeding can be minimized by avoiding puncturing the tympanic membrane near the umbo or annulus. In case of profuse bleeding from either the external auditory canal or a high-riding jugular bulb, the external auditory canal can be packed with a cotton ball soaked in oxymetazolin. Having the child sit up and having the parents soothe the child to reduce the pressure caused by crying may also help reduce bleeding. Gram staining of the middle ear specimen, as well as the susceptibility pattern of the organisms isolated, should be used to guide antimicrobial therapy. The small tympanic membrane perforation made during tympanocentesis usually heals in approximately two to three days, and some serosanguinous drainage during this period is normal. A cotton ball coated with petroleum jelly should be used during bathing to keep water out of the child's external auditory canal for the first three days. A follow-up exam should be scheduled three to four days after the procedure. This video provides only an introduction to tympanocentesis. Further training with an otolaryngologist is necessary. Tympanocentesis is an underused procedure. Clinicians should become familiar with tympanocentesis so that they can safely perform the procedure in children with acute otitis media.